Welcome, everyone. On, uh, on behalf of my co-hosts at uh, Fogarty Innovation, Stanford Biodesign, and Stanford Surgery, it's a real privilege to welcome you all to Fogarty Lecture number 24. This, uh, this is a hybrid, yeah, I know, it's, yeah, yes, it's good. A couple of web, this is a hybrid event, so there's about um, 80 people here in person and about 300 people out there in Zoom land. Uh, and uh, so for those in Zoom land, uh, this is a one-way broadcast, so you won't be seen or heard, probably. <laughs> Don't do anything really stupid. Uh, and finally, the broadcast is being recorded, uh, and we'll have it available on the web for future uh, uh, education. Um, 400 people here, pretty special on a hot Friday afternoon. And I think that says a lot about the lectureship and its tradition, the Silicon Valley MedTech ecosystem, and our speaker, Mir Imran. Yes. We, um, we put this together 24 years ago uh, to provide an annual forum to provide and promote MedTech innovation innovators and to expand the educational opportunities for our young people, first at Biodesign and now at Fogarty Innovation, uh, so that in the end, the outcomes are improved care for the lives of our patients whom we all serve. And uh, Tom Fogarty is a tireless champion, as is Mir for, you know, the customer is the patient, period, end of story, solve their problem and everything will be fine. The lectureship also celebrates bringing together like-minded people like you all, my Texas uh, beginning to kind of creep in, um, in, in this remarkable ecosystem of innovation with Dr. Fogarty in his very central role and, and ditto Mir Imran. Tom Fogarty's contributions are legendary, the Fogarty balloon catheter, Hancock tissue valve, the aortic stent graft, um, more than 50 successful med tech companies, 500 patents, you know, not bad for a Midwestern kid who's just getting started. Tom was, yeah, good, thank you. Tom was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. That's people like Edison, the Wright brothers, you know, big contributors. 15 years ago on this site, well not on this site actually, Tom founded the Fogarty Institute, a not-for-profit med tech educational incubator with the goal of facilitating the training of the next generation of Tom Fogarty's. And that mission continues under Andrew Cleland's incredible leadership uh, at Fogarty Innovation. So Andrew, thank you very much. In, in 2014, we had a unique opportunity when Dr. Fogarty at the White House received the National Medal uh, for uh, Technology Innovation from then President Barack Obama. Dr. Fogarty's bio is in the brochure. It's pretty good reading. Um, and take a look at the past lecturers. It's a who's who in med tech and technology innovation. 23 in all. Six of the past Fogarty lecturers are here, including Dr. Fogarty, Rodney Perkins, Paul Yock, Casey McGlynn, Deb Kilpatrick, and I haven't seen Brooke Byers yet, but he was uh, anticipated to be here. Mir Imran, the 24th Fogarty lecturer, is a most worthy addition to the roster. Mir is chairman and CEO of NQ Labs, a prolific healthcare innovator and entrepreneur who has been developing, commercializing, and solving patient problems for over 40 years. Mir's wife, Christine, and extended families join us uh, in the second row there. Thank you all so much for sharing Mir and for your role in Mir's journey. Mir began his career as a healthcare entrepreneur in the late 70s with pioneering contributions to the FDA's first approved implantable defibrillator. Since then, he's founded more than 20 life science companies, two tech companies, and 13 of the med tech companies have gone on to see liquidity events. His most recent uh, event, Ronnie Therapeutics, went public on the NASDAQ in 21. Mir's inventions literally have saved the lives of millions of patients and become standards of care. He's developed innovative therapies for a number of chronic diseases, and we just mentioned Ronnie. 
Mir holds more than 1,800 patents worldwide. QMed named Mir as one of the top 50 medical inventors of all time. Think about that. He's a fellow in the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Institute of Medical and Biomedical Engineers. He also is co-founder and managing director of InCube Ventures, a medtech biotech venture capital firm. He served on the boards of multiple life science companies and on the advisory board for Lemelson and an adjunct professor at the University of Pittsburgh. He actively supports education and training uh, in innovation and entrepreneurship, both in the United States and in India, especially for underprivileged kids. Mir's bio is also in your booklet, and it should also be a source of inspiration. Please join me in welcoming Mir Imran. As, as we planned this fireside chat, Mir wanted to highlight a few selected stories of how the magic happened. Uh, we all know Mir, before we dig into the med tech, two little interesting trivia bits. We all know Mir is a med tech pioneer, but did you know that his creativity extends far beyond med tech? Like what? Two selected examples. Number one, technology developed by Mir in the late 80s allowed access by authorized persons to private property with a unique electronic code. It also documented access and monitored. It was acquired by Supra GE in 1989. We all know it as the lockbox. Voila. Number two. Technology developed at InCube Labs provided a safe and less intrusive alternative to metal detectors and pat-downs. Can you imagine what that might be used for? It was sold to L3 Communications in two, 2006. We know it today as the airport body scanner, ubiquitous in the world's transportation networks, and those of us, like me with a joint replacement, know it well. <laughs> there you have that. I can't tell you how much fun it's been for me to dig into Mir's treasure trove of inventions, innovations, and their successful commercialization. So today's focus is on MedTech, and Mir is going to tell four stories that illustrates principles through the stories. The concepts will try to build on one another, and we've had a really good time trying to pull it together as something that was cohesive and thoughtful and would teach a next generation. We'll start first with this thoughts on the process of innovation, one that's studied and thought about both at Stanford Biodesign and at Fogarty, uh, but I think Mir's got his own thoughts and I found them incredibly instructive. The next story we'll look at is the internal defibrillator. A remarkable piece of equipment uh, solving a, uh, a, a, a really life-threatening problem. The third piece will be the diagnostic mapping uh, and, and ablative therapy for cardiac arrhythmias. And finally, Ronnie Therapeutics approach to put an injection in a pill. So with that, Mir, let, let's uh, have you kind of start talking through with us how you think about the process of innovation, how you work through a sequence of a problem, potential solution, commercial success, uh, and bringing it to the bedside. So again, it's wonderful to have you here, Mir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I start talking about innovation, um, I, I, uh, let me uh, first say thank you for inviting me here. It's such a huge honor. And uh, uh, Tom, you have been, uh, uh, whether you like it or not, you have been a mentor to me for the last 35 years. Uh, and you may not know this, but uh, I have really learned a lot just watching you. And um, there are so many others, uh, Paul York, uh, Casey, good to see you here after such a long time. Um, and Rodney, is, where is Rodney? Don't see him yet. But, yeah. uh... And Josh McHower, he's another icon in uh, MedTech. Josh, uh, so good to see you. I'm glad you're back in the Bay Area. And uh, um, so, you know, my journey started uh, a long time ago um, in the late 70s. And as, as a young scientist, engineer, 
I was truly interested in the whole process of creativity and um, in uh, what we call innovation, invention. And I was intrigued by how we do it. Is it always um, accidental? Uh, uh, in fact, in throughout history, it has been an accidental thing. And But I was really interested in seeing if there is a process that I can follow um, and what that would be. And I read a bunch of books uh, in those late 70s. Um, there weren't that many. There was a re one book written by a, a Stanford professor that was particularly interesting uh, called Higher Creativity. Um, but even that didn't explain what, how to do it, how, how to practice innovation at will, how to do that at will. And so I decided, and I was doing some of these innovations on on my own, probably intuitively I was I knew I was following a process that I couldn't articulate. So I decided to become an observer of that process I in me. So it, it, to see if there was a pattern that would emerge, and it took the next fifteen years of conscious observation and. Uh, and um, trying to figure it out. And really, in around the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, I began to see um, uh, uh, some hope of understanding that. And, and um, so the other thing that I decided to do is f de define the terms around innovation. When we talk about innovation, uh, we use the terms very loosely. You know, innovation itself is a word that uh, um, has got so many meanings, and you know, from politicians how they use it to scientists and lay people, it means different things to different people. But in the context of practicing in innovation, um, I decided to define it, and and because if unless you define something, you cannot own it, you cannot teach it. Uh, so, and and I uh, so the the simple definition that I came up with was innovation is the identification of a problem that's worth solving and framing of the problem. Which by that I mean really understanding so deeply that you can create you know frame it very succinctly. It doesn't matter. You, it's not the solution. To me, the solutions are the uh, inventions that that emanate from that that definition that that framing so that th that has really helped me um, uh, because i from that point on i have just focused on problems i don't care about solutions because once you frame it once you identify a problem and frame it uh, without even solving it there can be a dozen people who'll solve it with many different inventions so um, to me, that was a very uh, powerful insight that, that uh, I gained. Whether it's right or not, I don't know, but it has helped me, and, and I, I think it can be taught. And I know that biodesign has done an amazing job of uh, um, uh, teaching uh, innovation. But I think the biodesign focus, which I think necessarily was the right thing to do, was to change the way people uh, uh, people think, the, the, the way people observe uh, their power of observation, critical observation. And uh, the process Paul Yu and uh, Josh developed um, really uh, hits that point home. And um, so by need finding, you know, Coming up with an irrational number, you know, go find uh, <laughs> two, five hundred problems. Uh, it was a, a, a brilliant way of, of uh, uh, teaching people to observe everything, to question everything, look at everything as a potential problem. Don't accept anything uh, at face value. So, uh, luckily, I, I. You know, I had that growing up, so uh, I I was really looking to see um, what happens when you find a problem. Um, so 
uh, there are two questions that I, I, I think are really important in innovation. One is identifying, uh, when you identify a problem, ask the question whether the problem is worthy of solution. And um, that question leads you necessarily to a list of criteria that you can come up with to answer that question, that whether the, the problem is worth solving or not. And then the second question is, when you come up with solutions, is the solution worth commercializing? When you, and, and for each one of those questions, you can come up with attributes of problems and attributes of solutions that, are, um, that can be used um, to filter out what you shouldn't be working on. Not every problem needs to be solved and not every solution has commercial potential. So um, those are the simple things that I learned um, just observing what I was doing. And I, again, uh, Paul, I, one of these days you'll have to tell me where, um, uh, you know, where there are gaps in my understanding. Yeah, yeah it is interesting that the, the great innovators around and the two or three major med tech incubators are all thinking very much in terms of the, you know, the same line of reasoning that if you really understand the problem, the solution almost becomes self-evident. And you know, Josh and Paul have frequently said that becomes the DNA of, of, the, of the solution. Mir, you, you know, in our conversations, you talked, uh, I thought, thoughtfully about incremental innovation versus disruptive innovation. You've tended to focus on disruptive. Do you, you have a thought or two on that? Yeah, so um, uh, so the definition uh, is uh, kind of obvious, but as, a, as an engineer, I like to define things. You know, I, I don't like to leave things to imagination. Um, so incremental innovation clearly is uh, an improvement to an existing product or service that makes that product or service better. So that's kind of obvious. When you talk about disruptive innovations, generally speaking, you are rather than focused on a specific problem, a, a specific solution to improve it, you have to go back to the problem and perhaps redefine it, re-understand it, and, and maybe that new understanding leads to a disruptive solution, disruptive innovation. So one is focused on existing solutions, how to improve them, the other, on focused on problems uh, that uh, you, you spend time with that problem, understand it, iterate on the uh, solutions till you get a good solution. And that once you have that, a, a disruptive solution, then the, uh, for life cycle, it goes into the cycle of um, uh, incremental innovations. Yeah. Every, every product does that. That's right. The copycats follow. And I think Mir and his discussion with the student teams this afternoon kind of pointed out that while disruptive innovation is by definition harder, uh, the, the intellectual property space is much more wide open because you're not plowing the same ground. Uh, and the opportunities are typically much greater. And I think uh, uh, the, the second story we're going to touch bases on here uh, is w one of Mir's most um, profoundly disruptive solutions, and that's the implantable cardioversion defibrillator work begun in the 70s. So as Mir and I talked, he, he pointed out that the, the problem to be solved was the detection. Got to know that it's v, v fib and not VTAC, and that's an interesting, really, sidebar conversation But uh, for, for the electrophysiologists in the uh, audience, but then to treat it with an implantable system, because otherwise we wait till someone falls down on the ground in cardiac arrest, and then we go look for an a, a external defibrillator. There's a large body of patients that are at high risk, having had previous arrests, and so mere, you, you know, you think about, that's like, that's a 10-year problem, bare minimum, the day you start thinking about it. Mir first um, uh, developed this with Intech Systems, which was then acquired by Lilly, later spun out as Guidant, later acquired by Boston for $26 billion. So Mir, uh, you know, in 
10 minutes. Tell, t tell us about that saga, please. Well, I, 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 this is going to take the rest of the hour. <laughs> well, um, the so, time is yours. You know, the, um, clearly in, in, a, in a project or product or, or solution of that magnitude, there are so many people who contribute. And, and the single most important name in that is uh, that of a um, cardiologist from Baltimore named Michelle Mirowski. Uh, Mirowski was just an amazing guy. He was a passionate guy. And, and his passion for uh, the defibrillator st ha happened, started, uh, because his best friend died of sudden cardiac death, and there was no one to resuscitate him. So that became a lifelong um, uh, journey for him. And um, uh, I got involved uh, because I had, um, uh, you know, he had come to Rutgers Medical School, school to, give a, um, uh, to give a talk. And uh, uh, he, I met with him. And the head of uh, med the chief of surgery, Dr. McKenzie, introduced us and he said, "This crazy Indian kid can do anything, so you can uh, he might be able to help you." So that's how I got to meet him. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, we you know so at that time I was working on deep brain stimulation for uh, implantable deep brain stimulation systems, hand built for rhesus monkeys, for psychiatric uh, 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 research. And uh, so I had a little bit of uh, implant experience, nothing commercial. But, uh, you know, I was always that, uh, uh, I would always say that, yeah, I can do it well beyond my capability. And um, it was, um, and it actually pushed me, it was, a good um, device, it pushed me to, to perform. Uh, once you say I can do it, you have to prove that you can actually do it. And I think s many of us, I don't know if others experience that. You're smiling, what about you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the defibrillator journey was uh, difficult to begin with because uh, the understanding of cardiac arrhythmias uh, was not great. Um, and our understanding at, the, at that time was that people died of uh, fibrillation, spontaneous fibrillation. So our first device we designed to detect only fibrillation. And tachycardia, which is, you know, spiky signals were ignored. Even if it's a high-rate, high hemodynamically unstable tachycardia, we ignored it. And the first 10 patients would, uh, and these were really the sickest patients, they would have an episode, they would fall down, and the device wouldn't fire for minutes. And until their VT de de deteriorated into VF and they're on the brink of death when it this device would wake up and shock them and bring them back. And so that was a huge concern for us, and we stopped the clinical trial at that point, uh, put uh, Holter monitors on these patients, and realized that uh, uh, our detection was inadequate. We were not detecting these high-rate tachycardias. Um, and because we had these big, giant patch electrodes, uh, electrograms from those were not uh, usually, they, w they were very slow waveforms, and you couldn't reliably detect heart rate. So um, in one of these um, uh, trips to um, heart, uh, you know, American Heart Association and so on, we ran into a guy named Roger Winkle, um, who's a amazing cardiac electrophysiologist. He was at Stanford at the time, and he invited me to um, come and, uh, uh, you know, he was doing program stimulation to induce tachyarrhythmias. Um, Rodney, welcome. Um, so 
uh, I used to come with a tape recorder modified to be able to record cardiac uh, signals in his cat lab and record these things on tapes, take them back to Pittsburgh, play them through uh, detection circuits and uh, perfect those. And then we created the second generation. Now, FDA was amazingly easy to work with in those days. We would call them up and said, hey, we're going to make this improvement, this change, and we're going to send you the report. By phone, we would say that, and they say, okay, just send it to us. And, you know, this happened like within weeks after each. You know, it's unbelievable. I mean, um, but we didn't kill anybody. You know, we were careful. Uh, the uh, first sign of medical technology success is we didn't kill yeah, anybody. Yeah, I mean, so, so make a I, note. I, I, you can't even imagine how what a scary time it was for me to see these. You know, the decisions we were making were life and death decisions for these patients, and um, um, Roger was a huge help, and and. Uh, uh, went back and, and, and that device worked. We got amazing success and that success rate that we had for that second generation device has not been bested since then. Even the m most modern ICDs still have the same kind of success rate we got 40 years ago. Um, and so I, in 1982-83, Eli Lilly came in as an investor in the company and in 85, they acquired. And now, I, I, I'll add another uh, story. Um, in, uh, in and around 85 or 84, uh, towards the beginning of 85, I met um, a guy named uh, Ray Williams and uh, Bill Starling at a cardiac uh, uh, ACC or AHA. I don't remember which one. And... Um, they said, you know, Mir, you got to come out to California and help us, you know, let's build another defibrillator company. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I said, okay. I, you, Lily was in the process of acquiring it. They acquired the company, and I got in my car and came out to California um, uh, and was immediately sued uh, and... Uh, uh, and joined from, uh, uh, you know, I fought that for, with Her Harold Hobart was my lawyer, and um, we went to Pittsburgh many times. Uh, it was a long uh, six, seven months of litigation, and then we, uh, 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 VentureTex was running out of cash, but uh, Ray Williams told me, Mir, don't worry about it, I'll, I, I, I'm behind you. I mean, he was an amazing guy. Uh, many of you probably know him, know of him. Uh, he was, uh, um, he, you know, he had as, as big or bigger impact on MedTech um, than any uh, uh, scientist or physician or engineer. He was, he was really, um, I can't say enough about him. And he was an amazing woodworker. Um, so, um, and, you know, I used to occasionally go on weekends and um, help him with uh, some um, woodworking project. He had an amazing workshop. Uh, Casey, you may have seen it. Uh, he was quite a remarkable guy. So, Ventratex, I never was able to work there, but that went on to become uh, a success, and that's the story of the defibrillator. Stun stunning story. Do you have that original device? I do. I left it in the ah, conference okay. so, room. So, so at, the, uh, at the time of the reception, Muir has Smithsonian Institute quality um, devices, and, uh, you know, it's pretty hefty, uh, but uh, obviously... It was it about, about just shy of a pound, one pound of yeah. solid metal implanted in the belly, and, yeah. and then tunnel wires tunneled to the heart. You know, it was barbaric, you know, uh, what can I say, but it saved lives. And, and it was best in class, and what's interesting to me as we continue the story is the iterative process, right? So we didn't understand that VTAC could be just as bad as VFib, but 
you know, you had to figure that out. And, and I think, you know, like, you know, with great electrophysiologists like Paul Wong, the, the, the coming sub-segmentation of our knowledge then led Mir to think about, well, after the arrhythmia happens and someone drops, maybe we could move upstream a little bit uh, in the treatment of arrhythmias and, and instead of waiting for the problem and continually shocking them, maybe we could identify that irritable focus or foci in the myocardium uh, and then cure the lethal arrhythmias all at once and all together. So this involved a, another piece of the diagnostic piece of diagnostic mapping and detection of arrhythmia foci and then the targeted destruction of the lesion uh, and, uh, uh, you know, another little tiptoe through the tulips uh, discussion of that project, please, Mayor. So uh, that was way harder than um, developing the ICD. You know, n mapping the heart, a beating heart, and trying to figure out where the uh, uh, foci are for the, for the arrhythmia, where the reentry pathways are, and then be able to position another yeah. <laughs> steerable catheter yeah. for ablating those areas. Incredibly p difficult, and we spent years developing the technology. Uh, and the, the worst part was uh, it took hours, several hours, you know, half, you know, half a day sometimes to treat a patient. And the, the exposure to x-rays was unbelievable. And that got repeated with AFib uh, map, you know, ablation. And even today, AFib ablation is uh, uh, challenging. So it was a challenging thing, but in those patients that uh, um, got ablated in the right place, their arrhythmia was cured. Mm -hmm. But it was a hard, hard uh, pr procedure. And I don't know if any of you, uh, you're practicing, um, Cardiac electrophysiologists, uh, you would know, you would yeah, know yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Uh, how difficult these things are. For the lay people in the audience, I've often heard Fred St. Gore when he was talking about the MitraClip to to say, "We're doing all this thing inside a washing machine that's working," and so <laughs> the, you know, ringing motion associated with the way the heart compresses and and contracts blood rushes in, so you got a real moving target problem. D were there insights into how you identified uh, and how you stabilized the catheter? What was, was there a piece you in that story? You know, we, uh, the approach we took was to um, put a basket catheter that went in and expanded and uh, contacted the um, ventricle, usually you're in the left side and um, map it, and then while that catheter is there, put another catheter to steer to the right place. Mm -hmm. So, and we're using computers and graphics and to, to highlight it, it was not easy. Yeah, yeah. Is I, it easier now? <laughs> okay. It's, it's not that easy. I, yeah. The, um, and and uh, uh, tell us about the the original name because cardiac was, pathways. Yeah, yeah, but there was a, this was a cryoablation. And no, so. no. So so we were using RF ablation. Ah, okay. So one of the challenges with RF ablation inside the heart was that the tip would get so hot that the blood would clot. So you'd you'd bring the catheter out with a whole big clot on it. So uh, I came up with a simple solution to. Uh, cool the tip yeah. actively with, with saline and while ablating and work beautifully. And I think that that technique is still u in use 35 years later. <laughs> and it's, it was called the chili catheter, but many companies <laughs> are using that chilled ablation, uh, RF ablation. So that has uh, remained as a, as a Workhorse. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the chili catheter I remember in our conversations. And again, it's such a great story of the iterative process of moving from, okay, now we can, 
we can identify the lesion, we can get a, an ablative catheter to it, then it's too hot, okay, how do we cool it? I mean, you know, I, I think the entrepreneur's gift is to sort of, you know, run from unsolvable problem to unsolvable problem with unbridled optimism uh, over and over and over again. And, and for the young people in the audience, if you don't have that, why, you know, go into valet parking. Uh, it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot more predictable. Yeah. The, um, uh, uh, this was another, um, um, this was a guide, uh, uh, remind me on the acquisition of this one. Boston Scientific. Boston, that's right, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. The, uh, um, any other insights, uh, you know, that are worth uh, the audience hearing about before we move out of the heart? And No, I think I, I spend enough time in the heart, I want to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> But it also is interesting, we were talking about how the beehive of Silicon Valley has people that develop talent. Now all of a sudden in the valley we got people that understand cardiac mapping, that understand ways to um, approach and, and uh, uh, you know, lesion areas that, that are uh, problematically uh, difficult and, and you sort of build out this network of people and capabilities and the VP of engineering becomes the, you know, the chief operating officer, or the CEO of the next company. And I think, yep. you know, that's been a really powerful component. To, you know, sometime it'd be fun to do kind of a genealogy chart of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Fogarty's and where'd they go and the John Simpsons and the Yawks and the Perkins and the Imrons. I mean, I think it's just, you know, having now been out of the valley for 18 months, you really appreciate the deep, deep experience that is resident in, in people who live here and that are your friends and colleagues. I mean, it's pretty special. And then we aggregate them at places like BioDesign, aggregate them at places like here, aggregate them at, or aggravate them maybe at places like InCube. Okay. Um, moving on to the next big and more recent adventure, and that's Ronnie Therapeutics. Uh, some of you may or may not be aware of this, but uh, this is a disruptive technology for the oral delivery of biologics, so peptides, proteins, or antibodies, which ordinarily, if you took them as a pill, gastric acid denatures proteins, and so none of those can be taken as a pill. And the, so that acid environment is the enemy of delivering those kind of compounds. Now, we were talking with the students today. The drug companies say, well, no big deal, just a daily injection. Um, those in the audience who want to contemplate that, um, how much fun is a daily injection? Can that be done at home? You have to go into someone's office. And if you think about the... Uh, compliance associated with oral medication, which is 60% at best. Uh, the compliance with injectable um, compounds is even worse. So big, big problem, and the average person will say, well, just get an injection, but uh, undaunted Mir said, well, there's got to be another way to try to move these peptide biologics safely through the GI tract until a process can be done, and that is the story of Ronnie Therapeutics. So take yep. it away, Mir. Thank you. You know, so of all the crazy things I've done in my life, this is probably the hardest, most difficult uh, project um, uh, for a variety of reasons. So uh, this whole thing started with a, a very casual chance conversation with a, a senior executive from... Uh, uh, Eli Lilly, who was visiting me. Uh, some of you may know John Lecliter. He was the former head of, uh, head of Lilly. And I, I asked him what he came there for, and he said, you know, I, there was some board meeting, and there was a company they had invested a lot of money in uh, to convert a peptide, I think it was parathyroid hormone, uh, to an oral formulation. And uh, it failed. They were shutting down the, the company. So my uh, first question was, do they have equipment for sale? And, um, uh, and the second question was, why did they fail? And he said, well, we had very low expectations because, and, and I had never thought about oral delivery of biologics. So then I, I found out 
through research that there have been 150 separate attempts. Somebody has taken the trouble to count them uh, over the last 50 years, only focused on insulin, parathyroid hormone, and a couple of other short peptides. 150 attempts. Bioavailability in those cases, in best cases, were 1% or less, half a percent, a tenth of a percent. So I, I thought about it, and I said, well, we know that uh, injections work. And I also knew, remembered from the GI uh, track uh, uh, physiology that uh, you, uh, you don't have um, sharp pain receptors, the kind of sens sensory receptors you have in the skin. So I said, why can't we make a, a pill that you swallow and goes into the intestine, transforms itself into an injection, and delivers a pain-free injection? Um, and a piece of cake, right? Piece of cake. Is there a video that uh, yes, is lined yes. up? So uh, it's a one-minute video that you can... Okay, and uh, here we go. Ronnie Therapeutics, an InCube Labs company, has created a novel approach for the delivery of biologics orally. In this video, we will demonstrate how the Ronnie pill, our oral delivery platform, works. Here you see a patient swallowing what appears to be a standard capsule. The capsule has a special enteric coating that protects it from the acidic environment in the stomach. When the capsule encounters the higher pH levels found in the small intestine, the enteric coating and outer shell of the capsule dissolve, exposing the delivery mechanism to intestinal fluid. The mechanism has a self-inflating balloon that contains two reactants separated by a dissolvable valve. Exposure to intestinal fluid dissolves the valve, allowing the reactants to mix, creating carbon dioxide. This inflates the balloon and creates the pressure needed to inject a dissolvable microneedle containing the drug or sensor into the intestinal wall. The intestinal injection is pain-free as the intestines have no sharp pain receptors. The balloon then deflates and is safely passed out. In the case of drug delivery, the drug is quickly absorbed by the highly vascularized intestinal wall. A daily pill as an alternative to an injection is expected to have a very positive impact on patient compliance. Compliance is further enhanced by a digital wireless compliance monitoring system incorporated into the Rani pill. The Rani pill contains a tiny wireless sensor that is activated once the needle is delivered. Upon delivery, a radio transmitter embedded in the micro syringe emits a signal to an external receiver. An app on the patient's cell phone records the date and time of drug delivery and transmits this information to a cloud-based database. If a patient forgets to take the Rani pill, the smartphone app sends a reminder message to the patient which can further improve compliance. During clinical trials, knowing the exact time of drug delivery is very helpful in pharmacokinetic studies with short half-life drugs. In addition, the data from all the patient's cell phones will be collated via the cloud by the CRO. Ronnie wireless monitoring can also be used in post- Voila. Thank you. So uh, you can see it, uh, it, it's a uh, 25 cent um, cost of goods or less, a uh, piece of plastic, some uh, uh, Alka-Seltzer-like chemicals that inflate the balloon, and the balloon lines, up, lines it up to the intestine and delivers a pain-free injection. And we have uh, uh, conducted two clinical studies, with one with uh, um, uh, octreotide somatostatin and the other one with uh, parathyroid hormone. And we are embarking on uh, uh, Humira and many other antibody drugs. Uh, we, we can deliver 100% of the biologic drugs that are out there. And um, a number of pharma companies, of course, are after us uh, also. But we have taken um, five or six of the drugs that are off patent in, and, and created our internal pipeline. So we are developing our own uh, drugs and will of course work with pharma companies. So you know it looks simple and conceptually it is simple, but it was uh, 
uh, every step of the way we had to, you know, the needle made out of sugar. How many of you have made injection molded a sugar needle? It turns into caramel. And so uh, it, was, it, it really, uh, everything was difficult. Um, uh, the shape of the balloon, how do you make the balloon so that it works in every size intestine? not just uh, a particular size. So we have, that took a few years. How do you create a coating, entire coating that completely seals it off? Not even a little bit of moisture gets in. Uh, we had to come up with new formulations of coating. So it was uh, one challenge after another. 300 patents in this young company. Uh, it's, uh, I think we're, we're on a path to hopefully to success. Still a lot of work to be done, but we now are really getting into clinical trials, manufacturing scale up. So I'm super excited about this. It's, uh, it'll help uh, millions of people, tens of millions of people, and uh, it is the hardest thing I've done. I, I'm so, I, I was telling Paul that I just wanna retire after this. So that'll be a cold day. So, so who would have invested in the idea of Ronnie Therapeutics? So we're going to take this pill. It's going to, it's got a coating. The coating's going to dissolve. We got needles made of sugar. We got a balloon that pops open when an Alka-Seltzer tablet fizzes. Like that sounds like the worst investment possible. How how did you raise money for this other than your own? Um, you know, we were the first. My fund was the first investor. Then uh, Google got wind of it, and Google um, um, came in as a, the Series B investor, mm -hmm. and uh, then we, we brought in uh, some pharma partners came in, uh, Novartis, AstraZeneca, um, uh, Shire. So, um, uh, and then a number of family offices from China and South America. So it was um, not a single venture capitalist. Uh -huh. Because you're right, no, yeah. nobody in their right mind would invest in it. Yeah, no, it, it, I mean, it's almost sort of Rube Goldberg-ish, except it's brilliant in the, in the sequence and the pathways. And for the non-physicians in the audience, you know, the, there's just an enormous difference between being able to take a pill in the morning and somehow trying to figure out how to have someone stab you in the arm with a needle. It's a, so one of the biggest challenges was uh, knowing what is the size of the human intestine. So you talk to GI docs, they'll tell you, oh, it's approximately this much. And I said, well, what's the range? Nobody knows. Nobody had to know. Nobody, there was no need yep. to know that. So I uh, made a deal with the uh, CEO of um, Sutter Health, and they do about four or 500 uh, 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 organ transplants. And I said, I want to buy the intestines. You're not transplanting those. So we started getting human intestines freshly harvested, and we uh, I hired a pathologist on staff. And her job was to meticulously section every 10, 15 centimeters. So we created a database of human intestinal anatomy. Uh, and it was quite revealing. And that really helped us create a, 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 a device that would work across the whole spectrum of sizes. So that, that alone, what I just described, took two or three years of uh, effort to uh, not only collect the data, but make sense of it, and then develop the solution. So, not easy. No, I, sounds really hard to me. Um, I think if a biodesign kid had come up with this, we'd, we'd have probably told him to go do something a little easier, but that's, that's the beauty of, you know, blue sky kind of thing and, and a lifetime of experience. So, Mir, how do you think about that challenge of now, you got this thing and you got multiple competing companies all of whom want to use it and do you want to stay Switzerland or do you want to capitulate to the highest bidder? Or how, how do you think about that? Well, there are approximately 100 biologic drugs out there. Uh -huh. And so we will, you know, we're in conversations right now mm -hmm. about specific drugs or, or sometimes specific targets. Mm -hmm. um, so no one company has all the drugs. Mm -hmm. 
So I think we're going to end up with multiple partners, mm -hmm. potentially. Nice, nice, nice. Um, this has been a spectacular tiptoe through a 40-year career of remarkable contributions in med tech development. Uh, it, it's a, it, it just so many great insights, and I've been privileged to spend some time kind of prepping for this, but the, the creative ingenuity, like, like the story you just heard, uh, or all of the stories uh, with these life-saving consequences for millions of patients is uh, just truly unbelievable. And I think uh, uh, everyone in the audience and every one of your colleagues and friends in the Valley, you know, see you as one of the inhabitants of the Mount Olympus of MedTech inventors and innovators. And we're so grateful for your contributions and for your teaching and your presence here today. Mir, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, so, so every year we have a uh, Fogarty Eagle Award. So there, there are only 24 of these on the planet, so don't drop it or don't lose it. And the, the concept is the, the taking flight of, uh, young, uh, of, of young ideas and, and, uh, and young-minded people. Uh, and, and again, I think these have just been priceless stories, and so we're, we're so grateful. There's, there's an opportunity now, uh, we'll get into the refrigerated part of the thing, for uh, uh, a wine cheese reception and a chance to uh, reconnect with each other since it's been such a long time since we've uh, all had a chance to congregate. So again, thank you all for your participation and here, thank you. Fantastic.